Yep, okay, no worries. Cool, so thanks for joining me tonight, guys. It's one of the first times I've done an actual presentation like this online. I've done a couple of like workshops before now. I've done a house plant masterclass and a kind of store cupboard secrets presentation, but first time to do a true Zoom presentation. So thanks for joining me tonight. I'm gonna to talk about rude botany. So I think this is gonna give you a giggle. Don't be offended by any of the names if they're a bit rude or if anything looks like a penis accidentally or by design. So we're going to talk through a lot of different plants in the natural world. We're going to talk about how plants kind of have, se have sex as well. We're going to talk about plants that look like weird things, plants that smell like weird things. And yeah, so we're going to have a lot of fun with our root botany tonight. So this is a presentation that I originally built for um, a show that I did in Canada last September. So it hasn't been shown to the public many times at all, but it's really a celebration of the cheekiest plants in the natural world. So I'll start to flip through. So first of all, just to introduce myself, I think Nat gave a good intro, but I'm, I've got no idea what she said. So I'll tell you in my own words. <laughs> So I've basically been obsessed with plants since I was a, a kid. So I was gardening with my grandparents and I really got the gardening bug from them and started um, growing plants when I was a kid. I was selling plants when I was in my teenage years. I was a member of the Women's Institute Market with my grandma and used to sell plants there at the end of the driveway. I even had my own herb nursery called Springfield Herb Nursery. And I was supplementing my pocket money by selling thyme, sage, all sorts of unusual herbs. So I was always obsessed with plants, but also obsessed with money as well. And I managed to find a way to make it both happen. So I've had a long career in the industry. Um, I'll give you a little bit of info on how I got into my job, first of all, because I think that's really, really useful for some of us. Um, I was at school and obviously had this kind of gardening obsession in my spare time and spending lots of time with my grandparents and doing a lot of things that were really uncool at that age because of course when I was a teenager everybody had to be into the same stuff and kind of you know wear the same jackets. I feel like you could potentially be a lot more individual these days but back then it wasn't that way. And so I really kept this all a secret from my friends. And as I got to the end of school, I, the careers advisors weren't necessarily very helpful. They suggested um, they had a kind of computer where they put all the information in and then it feeds out some suggestions. And I think there was florist and there was vet um, and something else that I can't remember. So nothing that I really, really wanted to do, but I kind of wasn't sure where I would fit in horticulture or what I could even do. And I didn't want to be a landscape gardener necessarily. I was more of a kind of plantsman as it were. So got towards the end of school and just kind of fell into going to horticultural college. Sadly, in those days, if they weren't sure what to do with you, they sent you to horticultural college, which is kind of a bit of a piss take and hopefully it's not the way that they look at it these days. So that was kind of why I went to Hawk College, but obviously it was very good for me and it was the sort of stuff that I was interested in. So I did a two year course, the National Diploma in Horticulture at Otley College in Suffolk. It was very general, the course. So stuff I was good at like biology, plant identification, you know, obviously I found a breeze and really enjoyed, but then there was other things that were a bit less kind of linked to what I wanted to do. So driving a tractor and I was really rubbish at driving a tractor and I don't know why I have a four by four now because I couldn't even drive the tractor. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that kind of happened. Um, but I wasn't really that good at planning ahead and I was doing some work for a garden designer in the local area and I actually met a lot of great people, got some great contacts through him, but still I wasn't sure what opportunities lie in horticulture. And it just so happened, it's serendipitous moment, there was a competition in the local newspaper to design a garden. And this garden would be built at Thompson & Morgan, which is a mail order plant company that you perhaps know. And I put a design together and I filled this garden design with plants that were raised in the Suffolk area. So it kind of had that marketing spin to it already. And I won the competition and basically 
followed my own initiative and wrote into the company for a job two weeks later. And they brought me on as an apprentice. So I was applying for a job that didn't even exist, started doing what was really my dream job. You know, I was going out there searching for new seed varieties. Um, my first mission was to go to Glasgow to collect a petunia with star-shaped petals. So it was a really, really great career. And I was with Thompson Morgan for 18 years. And as you'll see back on the screen, I introduced more than 500 brand new plants across the UK, including some oddballs like the Tom Tato or the egg and chips plant, which is aubergines on the top, potatoes on the bottom, all on one plant. So it's grafted, so it grows as one. Also concepts like uh, fuchsia berry, ground cover lilies, climbing petunias. So these were not new varieties, but these were existing plants that we then used in different ways. So kind of like rebranding them almost. Um, I started using social media maybe 15 years ago when I started doing QVC. Um, and I've really made the most of that and I use it as my shop window. So I try to not be ashamed of showing off what I'm doing, what I'm up to. You know, sometimes people are ashamed to do that because they're worried what their friends will think. But to me, social media is a tool for my career. So if any of my friends are like, oh, you're boasting again, then nah, I'm going to block them or something because that's not what it's there for. And I think social media has become such a useful tool for co progressing your career and getting opportunities. And, you know, I'm, I just need to be out there and kind of have this as my shop window to be professional. And people then approach me with the most amazing offers and they just come at random. So I would say just keep pumping out there the things that you do and show people what you're good at and never be ashamed to do that either. I started to build the website, Mr. Plant Geek, probably about 10 years ago now. And I'm really, really proud of how that's developed because have a little look on there and you'll see that I kind of look at things from a very different angle. So I don't want to be another website that's telling you what to do in the garden in April or May. I want to be a website that's telling you about unusual stuff. You know, the insider's guide to plug plants, you know, talking about five weird and wacky plants. So kind of almost, I wanted it to be like a buzzfeed of the horticultural world. So kind of hopefully it's halfway, halfway towards that. Um, you can't see my tattoos in real life right now, but you can see on the screen. So I've got a fair few botanical tattoos, including a naked man or kid or Kisitalica. And I do various bits on TV as well, not just QVC, but ITV this morning. And I uh, did a piece on Steph's packed lunch last week. And we're going back in with rude botany plants in a couple of weeks as well. So we're seeing what stock we can get of things that look like dicks. <laughs> so weird and wacky plants can delight all the senses. So let's have a little look, first of all, just to get us warmed up of a few cool plants that are out there that are kind of really apply to all the different senses. So we're going to start with touch. So this is a plant you may or may not know. It's the sensitive plant. So this is really, really fun to grow from seed. I was growing this from seed with my grandma when I was a kid. It's really, really great memories of doing that. It's a plant that is capable of rapid movement. Now there's very few plants that are capable of that. Another one you'll recognize is a Venus flytrap. Now it's kind of inconclusive as to why they do that movement, but it's often said that it's to protect the plants from predators. So you know that when you're, when you're fiddling around with this plant and it kind of curls up when you touch it, that is really stopping any predators getting to it. And it sometimes takes a couple of hours for that to come back as well. So I always feel a bit cruel when I do that to a sensitive plant. I feel like I shouldn't be doing that. So yeah, really easy to grow, indoor plant as well. And don't underestimate those gorgeous blooms as well that you'll hopefully get in the summer if the plants are happy. Next up, so this is sight. So let's have a look at this weirdo. This is the Duff Vader flower. Now this is Aristolochia salvadorensis. This is a plant that's endemic to the soggy floodplains of Brazil. And it has this appearance of Darth Vader. And it does that in order to create this hooded appearance with luminous eyes in the center. 
and they show the pollinators the right way to go. So even late at night, they almost like glow in the night time. So that means that pollinators can get inside, pollinate this flower, and at the same time, this flower has a real fragrance of rotting meat as well, which again attracts those beetles and flies that pollinate this plant. Unfortunately, this is one that's a little bit too difficult to grow at home, but it's one that you can enjoy in a lot of botanical gardens. It's uh, obviously very, very tropical, and the blooms tend to be all around the base of the plant, even though it's a tall vining plant. So really, really an oddity, and one of my favorite weird and wacky plants. Next up, we've got the sandbox tree. Now, this is an Amazon rainforest plant that can actually launch its seed at 70 meters per second, and that is the fastest traveling plant in the world. And it also makes it the loudest plant in the world because this audibly, you know, the ripe fruit actually splits and it can be heard cracking as it opens. And then of course, when it hits a tree nearby at 70 meters per, per second, you can tell that this is your loudest plant that is in the rainforest. So that is Cura crepitans, also known as the sandbox tree, because originally they also used those seed capsules as a kind of like a holder for pens and ink blotting. Next up, smell. Now there's a lot of plants that smell of weird things, great things. This is the peanut butter bush. This is Clerodendron trichotomum. And this has, oops, so this has, a really amazing fragrance on the leaves, which is kind of like peanut butter. It's really, really unusual. Fragrance, not necessarily in the leaves here, but when it's in the flowers, that is to attract pollinators. And this glory boa clerodendron needs bees and butterflies to help that pollination. So this kind of fragrance in the leaves is almost like a byproduct because it's really the flowers that need to attract those pollinators. It's a plant that's actually hardy, so you can grow this in the UK, and it's really unusual. You can grow it as a relatively small shrub in a patio pot as well. So next up, the taste is, oh, we should have done a kind of taste test where we send everybody miracle berries at home, because this is a berry that you can actually buy on Amazon or eBay, so make sure that you look out for real miracle berries. They'll often be freeze dried, don't buy the tablets that are made from them because they aren't half as good. So this is a plant called Cincipalum dulcificum, and this is from the warm, acidic lands of West Africa. Very hard for us to grow in this country, but a few years ago, I was actually sent a live plant with berries on from a colleague in China, and I actually got to try the berries for real in real life. And what this does, the berry has a molecule inside called miraculin, and this changes the pH receptors on the tongue. So basically, this turns up the pH to foods. So it will make something acidic into something sweet. So vinegar turns into cider, sweet cider. Lemons turn into a sweet sherbet. It's absolutely amazing, and it also works on sweet foods as well. So if you were to eat a strawberry after chewing on a miracle berry, you would actually have the most amazing sweet candy in your mouth. It would actually turn up the pH of that strawberry. So an amazing plant, difficult to grow in the UK because it needs that humidity and that acidic soil, but definitely something that's worth hunting down on the internet to get some of those berries to try for yourself and maybe have a kind of flavor changing party or something. It works really well with beer as well. It makes beer kind of into this kind of sweet, sweet beer as well. So you can try it with all different sorts of food, even gherkins. So we're gonna look at weird and wacky plants in this presentation today. And this is obviously the X-rated edition, which I tend to brand as rude botany. So. Here's a few Rudies that you may have seen already. So we've got fungus, we've got a poppy, right hand corner, you've got the clitoria at the bottom, and you've got the clathrus down there. So are they rude? You decide. So we're gonna have a little look at the world of horticultural smut. So first of all, there's a lot of cheeky words in our industry, isn't there? So hoeing, seeding, pricking out as well. And some of these phrases 
we kind of say ourselves and we don't realize how much smut is in them. And it's only when you've got a non horticultural friend or colleague that then is kind of laughing at all these crazy phrases that we use. And of course, a lot of plant names that actually sound rude as well, that, you know, we're so used to that we don't realize how rude they are. So there is a real cheeky world out there. So first of all, looking at a few plants that look rude. So first up, we got the male body. So this is the hairy bulls plant, and this is called Omphocarpus physocarpus. And you can see, this is actually the seed pod of the plant. So it actually creates this inflated seed pod at the end of the season, which has these hairs on. So it really does look like a pair of hairy bulls. An excellent plant for flower arranging. You often see this dried and fresh in the florist in the autumn. And more importantly, it's a vital caterpillar feed and it's pollinated by wasps in cooler countries. So that's very interesting because we always think that wasps haven't got a place in the garden, but they have because this plant relies on them for pollination. Next up, we've got your common stink horn. Now this is a fungus. Is Phallus impudicus. People giggle at the sight of this. People also giggle at the name with this one as well. It's not endemic to any specific region. So it could pop up in your back garden, on your compost heap. It's actually a really pungent fungus as well. And that is designed to attract flies to the fungus. And that's not because the flies need to pollinate the fungus. It's because they actually produce spores, which are like mini miniature little seeds, and it then wants the flies to carry those spores away on the back of their legs in order to then spread its lovely kind of penisness everywhere. Next up, we've got some arse. So we've got living stones. We've got Lithops, Russianorium, Neelii. Oh no, Nat, you can't bring a child here. This is inappropriate for under 18s. <laughs> Sorry, he's going now. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at these bums. So these are plants called lithops and they actually mimic stones in the wild. So they actually try and look like stones in order to protect themselves from predators. I follow a guy that lives in South Africa and I was amazed when I, I saw some that he had in his driveway the other week and they literally look like kind of like goat droppings or something. They're really the strangest plants you can find. Native to cold deserts and around Namibia, kind of on rocky outcrops, they have small windows on the surface which let in light for photosynthesis. So if you look up lithops, you'll be able to grow them from seed, you'll be able to buy various ones from cacti and succulent growers as well, or if you can find it, the lithops Rushnorium nealii, which actually has the smoothest type of bum, as you can see there. And the flower is always quite a surprise when that comes out later in the season too. Because it's always really unexpected, like not how it emerges, but just the fact that you've got this amazing daisy flower coming out of this weird sort of succulent. And I don't know, it's amazing. It's one of the first things that I grew from seed when I was a kid as well. And if you haven't grown cacti and succulents from seed, you really need to give it a go because it's so much fun because you see the cactus and the succulent like literally come out of the soil in this real juvenile stage and you slowly see it form its kind of adult life and the spines and it's really really cool and a lot easier than you might imagine. So we're on to female bodies now first of all we've got tits so we've got the breast plant which is Myrtilla cactus uh, Nizimboku, which is almost rude itself now this is um well it's a cactus so is it areole or areola it's actually an amazing plant that is not a naturally occurring plant so this is an actual variety so this is a random sport that appeared in mexico and they selected it because it had this really unique appearance which looks a little bit like boobs so Next up, we've got Hynora africana. Now this could look like a vagina. This is actually a parasitic plant. So this is a plant that spends most of its life underground and it only emerges to flower. And when it does that, it emits an odor of feces. 
And that is to then attract those pollinating beetles. So it's a really, really fascinating plant. If you see this on time lapse, you really, you really could believe in aliens, the, the sight of this plant. It's absolutely amazing. Next up, we've got Clitorius. So this is Clitoria ternatia. Now this is an amazing plant, and this is one that you can grow in the UK as a summer climber. It's almost like a kind of annual wisteria, the way that it grows, because it vines up to about six feet in the season. Flowers quite late in the season, but when you get those blooms, they are the richest blue you can imagine. It's an amazing plant that is very useful medicinally, for soil improvement because it fixes nitrogen into the soil like much of the legume family and it's used for food coloring a lot in Asia. In Thailand they often color sticky rice dishes with the blue dye in this clitoria. It's also been used in various gins and when you put the tonic water into the gin it actually changes the drink to a pink color from the blue as well. But of course it's kind of obvious how it's got its, got its name. And then dead man's fingers. Now this is another fungus. So this can often be found in forests and woodland areas, often grown from the base of decaying wood or old bark and old logs. It's an amazing plant, but it really varies a lot in its form. So sometimes the fingers will be fat, Sometimes they'll be skinny, sometimes they'll be a little bit deformed, or sometimes they'll simply be a bunch of thumbs. Now, we're going to talk about sex for a bit. So, have you heard of a pearl necklace? <laughs> this is an eelgrass called Zosteria. Now, this is a plant that has adapted to living in the water. And what it does, it creates a slimy band of its pollen that then gets snagged around female flowers. So it actually is, it's developed a way to actually survive in those conditions. It grows along the bay, along Jersey Shore, and it solely relies on the water for that pollination. Isn't that incredible? So there's no insect involved, there's no fish or anything, it's just relying on the water movement and it's great pearly necklace. Now this is a plant that can shoot its load 20 feet. This is the squirting cucumber. This is one you can buy seed of and you can grow in the UK as well. And it can shoot the seed 20 feet away from the plant. It basically explodes and you've got this kind of stream of liquid that includes the seeds. It's another plant that's capable of rapid movement, like the mimosa we saw earlier, like the Venus flytrap like the dancing plant, if you ever come across Desmodium gyrans, that is another plant that can move itself. So, squirting cucumber, this grows a lot wild. Um, I saw a lot in Greece last summer, it's just down by the side of the road, and you can tell when it's ready to pop because the seed pods obviously turn a little bit yellow, and when you touch it near the base, it literally explodes, and I was exploding these by hand. And it actually kind of almost like made my fingers hurt because it pings like an elastic band. There is so much speed and strength in this. And that is just amazing nature. It really is. So that is your squirting cucumber. Now this is all about having sex in the dark. So this is Arisema, also known as Jack in the pulpit. So this is Arisema speciosa. Now this wants bees to go inside and get disorientated and dusted with pollen. Then it doesn't let them out until it knows that they're dusted well with the pollen, and then it lets them out through the bottom of the flower, and they then fly to a female flower, and pollination takes place. Absolutely amazing. Once they get to the female flower, though, it's a little bit unfair because then it can't escape, so the bee dies inside this plant. So it had sex in the dark and then died for that purpose. Great, huh? <laughs> so this is a plant that wants an insect to have sex with it. This is the flying duck orchid, Calliana major. Now look, it looks like a flying duck. So first of all, you'll think, why has it been designed to look like a duck? Is it trying to attract a duck to copulate with it? No, not quite. This is trying to attract a male sawfly. 
the sawfly will think that this is a female and then do something which is called sodocopulation. This is when it actually tries to have sex with the flower and in the process it pollinates the bloom. So this might look like a duck but it's actually designed to look like a sawfly. Now this is an incredible plant. Giant water lilies, so these are some of the biggest water lilies, more than a meter across. The strength of these, they can almost hold a baby. I'm sure you've all seen these pictures of toddlers on Victoria Amazonica. Underneath, it's almost like a kind of bubble wrap. So you've got all of these little pockets that actually give that elevation as well. Incredible plant. Obviously, it has blooms at a certain time of year, and those blooms have a pineapple fragrance, so really, really beautiful fragrance. And that actually attracts beetles into the bloom. They then get trapped, and then the next day, the flower has actually changed from pink into white, and it's actually changed sex. So that means that pollination can then take place. So this is highly advanced incredible plants that is your victoria amazonica then we've got gender fluid plants now this is native to australia this is the dungawan bush tomato so this is from the solanum family and this is actually a plant that scientists believe is gender fluid so it just changes its sex from time to time it's tended to confuse scientists at first but they've recently found some dna that actually proves that fact as well and then having sex in the bush with yourself that seems like something you get arrested for i'm sure this is viola sororia which is the blue violet which is native to lots of different parts of europe this is a really amazing viola because it flowers once in the season at normal time of year and then again it flowers with secondary buds and they don't actually open they kind of remain down in dirt and then the male and female parts get a chance to fertilize themselves. So it's almost like a kind of safeguard. So if it doesn't get pollinated the first time around, it's developed a way to make sure that that definitely can happen. And then a plant that can have sex with itself quite happily. So Holcoglossum amasianum. So this has complete floral flexibility. So the male part of the flower can actually twist and spin all the way around in order to fertilize the female part by itself. So it initially confused scientists because they couldn't see how pollination was taking place. They didn't detect any bees or butterflies or any pollinating insects. They also didn't find that the wind had made it happen, but it actually fertilizes itself. So it's really, <laughs> it's really developed a way to look after itself. So this is an amazing orchid with an incredible ability. So a few plants that smell rude. So first of all, did you know that flocks like Divaricata, Subulata, actually smell of cannabis? So next up, this is, oh, I can't remember what this is called, but this is some sort of umbellifer like hogweed and this actually smells of old socks and then phallus impudicus which smells of feces and this this is pyrus caloriana which smells of sperm i'm sure you've seen this one in the spring as well there's a really really great sketch by um ah oh, who is it armstrong and miller i think they're called a comedy duo have a look on YouTube and there's this whole skit about how this tree smells of sperm. It's amazing. And it involves Queen Victoria. So it sounds odd, but it's great. <laughs> so plants that sound rude. So what have we got here? This is a plant that creates a lot of giggles at college. We used to giggle at this at college. We totally overlooked the fact that it was a great winter interest plant because we were too busy laughing at the name of Rubus Cockburnie Anus. I mean, you couldn't make that up, could you? Next up, you've got a plant which is called Galium aparine, which sounds pretty innocent. That's just the Latin name. But it's also known as goosegrass, cleavers, and sticky willy. <laughs> and this is a plant that grows wild. So this is pretty much a wildflower in the UK. 
And it's the one that you used to throw at your friends because it kind of sticks on their backs. And that is actually how the plant spreads and survives and spreads its seed everywhere as well. So a really, really great plant, lovely wildflower, and it actually has nutritional benefits as well. So you can boil this up in the kitchen and use it as a leaf vegetable. So a little section here looking at some of the most dangerous plants. So first of all, what is the most poisonous fungus? It is Amanita phylloides, which is known as the death cap. And this is responsible for 90% of the fatal poisonings that are caused by fungi. So that is your Amanita phylloides. Next up, the most painful plant. This is Dendrocnoide moroides, also known as the gimpy gimpy plant. Now this is covered in neurotoxin hairs that can create a pain that stays for anything up to a year. It's absolutely said to be excruciating. There's a plant in Leiden Botanical Garden in Holland if you, if you dare get close to it, but it's actually behind a Perspex screen because it's really, really dangerous. The neurotoxin hairs, almost, uh, you can't get them out of your skin. It's almost like um, as bad as having, well, it's actually a lot worse than having lily pollen on your trousers. Do you know what I mean? It's a really, really serious plant. So it's really hard to get those hairs out. But quite oddly, look at the name. So this is Dendrocnoide moroides. Now that is actually related to Morris, which is a mulberry tree. And this plant actually has edible fruits similar to a mulberry that actually change for a lovely selection of colours. But of course, you're never going to be brave enough to pick them and eat them, are you? So next we've got the most dangerous tree. Now this is Hippomane mans mansilella. Now this has a sap that its trunk exudes, which is poisonous, acidic, and mere contact with human skin can cause blisters and blindness. So very, very dangerous plant known as manchineal. And of course, hemlock you may have heard of. Hemlock is one of the most dangerous plants that we have in our, in our wild, kind uh, of in the countryside in the UK. Then you've got abrin, which is the seed that you can see there, the red one, which completely shuts down the body. Very, very dangerous. They sometimes use it in necklaces in different countries, which is kind of almost quite risky. Sabera, which is down at the left, can cause fatal heart problems and Agerantina can cause deadly stomach problems. So there's a lot of risks out there if you don't know what you're doing. Then to bring us towards the end of our rude botany session, we'll look at a few frightful fungi. So we've got devil's fingers here, which has this kind of weird kind of egg inside, real alien way. We've got the lattice stink horn as well, which again smells like rotting flesh. And then you've got the Ophiocordyceps, which turns insects into zombies by hijacking their nervous system. Then it gets them to do exactly what it wants them to. A few more here. You've got Rhododotus, which is veiny and kind of with a really, really strange appearance. Jelly drop mushrooms as well that look um, a bit strange. <laughs> look like brains kind of just exploding out of the moss there. And then you've got the bleeding tooth orchid, which oozes a blood-like red liquid from the fruit. So it looks like you could easily come across those in any part of the world in the UK, though, by the looks of it. So take care. So just a little glimpse of my website here, which is mrplantgeek.com. It's actually had a bit of a redesign since then. So you'll see that it's uh, almost a little bit more newsy these days, kind of quite chatty, lots of cool information on there, I believe. And you can also follow me on social media. There's a website for Rude Botany, which is rudebotany.com. And there's a range of t-shirts there, which have got all of these geeky names. So Clitoria, Rubus Cockburn Anus, uh, Philadelphus Erectus, Rose Golden Showers, Silly Bum, Marianum. So, choose your rude botany t-shirt and wear it with pride also there's a bit of merch there from the weird and wacky plants range and that is my weird and wacky plants kind of um graphics really because that is where this show really came out from so 
I built the Weird and Wacky Plants brand probably about five years ago and have been working on that in lots of different angles. So one angle is obviously rude botany or the weird stuff, which is rude as well. And also we've done Weird and Wacky Flavours at Hampton Court Show as well and Weird and Wacky Bug Show at Tatton Park. So hopefully you enjoyed the presentation and you weren't too embarrassed by some of the things.